Well, thank you uh, once again, uh, the Dixie Band Borromeum. Um, as mentioned it, uh, one uh, topic of this conference will be the enlargement uh, process. And, and North Macedonia, like other countries, is already waiting since the summit of Thessaloniki, which was in 2003 at the gates of Europe. Uh, the process has been accelerated uh, in the last years. So I'm really looking forward what the Prime Minister of North uh, Macedonia uh, has to tell us. He will hold the, the keynote speech. Let me shortly uh, introduce him. Uh, Christian uh, Miskorski is the Prime Minister of North Macedonia since this year. Uh, he is the leader of the Conservative uh, Party there. We just talked before, he has a connection also with uh, Vienna. As a professor uh, for mechatronics, he was, uh, he teached at the uh, Technical University in, in Vienna for quite a while, and later on also taught as a professor in universities in Skopje. Mr. Prime Minister, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thanks for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for this uh, nice introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, dear chairman, it's my honor and I'm pretty much delighted to stand in front of you and to talk about the ideas and uh, the vision of uh, the newly elected government in my country. And also to say some sentences regarding our EU accession process, which means for us like a never-ending story, unfortunately. And, and I will be very open and frank. And uh, when you are among friends, and I consider you all of you here friends, then we should talk openly, straightforward. And uh, when we are talking very open and straightforward, then we might expect some feedback. Otherwise, we will lose ourselves into the fog and will not be able to reach any solution. Therefore, illusion is not a part of my, my politics. I'm an engineer, I'm not so-called political animal. I got into politics since the very young age as a member of the youth of Umar Depomane. In that time, that was just after the separation from former Federation of Yugoslavia. And uh, we were very happy that finally we had our own independent state. And at that time, as a Vomero Depomana, we were inspired soon from then to become a part of the NATO alliance and uh, as soon as possible to join European Union, as all other former communist states. We were not literally communist state, we were more or less socialist state, but however, the challenge was in front of us as uh, a young generation, which grew up in the former federation and studied abroad, we decided to, to bring some added value to our society and to do anything what is in our power to help our country to become one day member of NATO Alliance and uh, to become a member of European Union. I will start from the very beginning. It was 2000, not 2003. And to be more precise, it was 2000 when we started officially our journey to European Union, even prior to Croatia. We signed in that time in Zagreb this stabilization and association treaty with the European Union. It was one year prior to Croatia. Together with Croatia, we become a candidate country in 2005. And then in 2008, we received, together with Croatia, first positive report from the European Commission to start negotiations. 
Unfortunately, 16 years afterwards, we are not able to start our negotiations because of, for me, some un not understandable reasons or artificial constraints that were imposed in front of us, unfortunately, unfortunately, which are not aligned with so-called Copenhagen criteria, but most of them are with the focus on bilateral disputes. And now Croatia is for almost more than 10 years part of the European family. They are now part of the Schengen zone. They're using Euro as a national currency. And we are, after more than 16 years, not able to start our negotiations. First, it was named dispute with our southern neighbor, Greece, which was, to be honest, very humiliating process for us because in the 21st century, talking about your name is something very not usual, you must admit. Someone to object on your name doesn't make sense. Nothing has in common with the Copenhagen criteria as well. But that was practically something what was our first and very serious artificial constraint imposed in front of us. That type of pressure was exerted on us. And uh, despite that you might like or dislike, but previous government reached an agreement internationally known as a PRESP agreement. And since then on, our constitutional name was changed and uh, that constitutional name now is North Macedonia. Previously, it was Republic of Macedonia, internationally known as a former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And then finally after PRESPA, the new constitutional name is Republic of North Macedonia. It's very humiliating. But that is the reality. If you want to be a politician, which is a part of reality, then you have to be aware about the reality. But what, most, what was the utmost problem for all of us, citizens of my, of my country? During the process of changing our constitutional name, a lot of people from Europe, from Brussels, from all over the world visited us. And at that time, I still can listen the voice of our bilaterals that, look, Christian, I was in that time newly elected president of the opposition. Look, Christian, this is the last thing that you have to do. Change your name and immediately you will become a member of NATO and you will start negotiations with the European Union I immediately without additional conditions. Since you are a front runner in the region, within a period of four or five years, you will become a member of the European family. Those four or five years expired past year. And we are not we are still in the lobby, we are not in the room, in the, on the table, negotiating. As a matter of fact, we are in the wear drop now. Why? Because since autumn 2019, we have now additional constraint, additional condition, additional hurdle in front of us with aim again to change our constitution. The wounds from the last change of our constitution are not closed yet. And again, if we want to start our negotiations, we have to accept this as a business as usual and continue forward. We've been disappointed because I still can listen to the words back in 2018. 
promises, commitments. By the way, I just want to remind you that in the past we changed our flag. That was condition for us to become a member of the United Nations. We changed our currency as well. We changed after the military conflict back in 2001 our constitution a couple of times. And always there was promise, look, accept this and that is the last. You will move forward. But however, always there was something additional. There was something additional. So let me back to the, to the current issue. Now we have to change our constitution again. What, what is the need of additional change? We have to bring in our preambula, in our constitution, small Bulgarian minority. And we are talking about a couple of hundreds our citizens. I'm very precise. We are not talking about a couple of hundred thousand. We are talking about between 800 and 900 citizens of my country, which are saying for them that they are a part of Bulgarian community. And our preambula, we are that like constitution, is descriptive part which says this is the country of this nation, that nation, etc., etc., etc. And normally, usually, someone of you or someone from international community will say, look, this is business as usual, do that and finish the story and move on. It would be simple as that if this was first one. But this is tenth in a row. During the past nine, we failed. Not we, literally we. we. We do have a lot of internal issues, but who does not? When it comes to the external delivery, there was always talk that came from abroad without work. So delivery was missing. Always commitments. And how the time was passing by, frustration increased and growth and now the feeling um, among my citizens is that we've been betrayed by European values. We've been betrayed. Because now again we have additional, additional condition, additional constraint. And then we are wondering, okay, we have to stand now as a politicians. Our pools are brilliant. Probably we are the biggest political party in the country. All other political parties jointly has less than 3% support from the citizens in the country. We have solid majority, 40, 64 out of 120 MPs. We have more or less two-third majority in the parliament, more than 80 out of 120. So we are politically wise in a good, in a good situation, a good environment. We are very comfortable. And I have to stand now in front of my citizens saying that, look, dear, citizens, my students, we have to change constitution again. Sorry for your wounds from the last constitutional change, but that's it. You know, this is a business as usual. No one can understand us. No one can understand us. We are a small nation at the heart of the Balkans, landlocked country, and we have to do this step if we want to start negotiations. Then normally, we have to foresee what type of questions we might receive from our citizens. First, what I bear in mind is why we have to do this? Why we have to do this? What about Macedonian community in Bulgaria? And we are not talking, believe me, about a hundred. We are talking about tens of thousands of people. Whether someone rights, human rights being violated, and this is the reason why we should do this change again and again and again. Who we are politicians to judge whether someone rights being violated? No, we can only misuse this issue. There is an institution in Europe which is responsible to judge whether someone rights being violated or not. And the name of that institution is Human Rights Court in Strasbourg. And what Human Rights Court in Strasbourg decided last couple of years, 14 times in a favor of 
Macedonian community in Bulgaria. I will explain you later why they decided as such. And zero times for Bulgarian community in North Macedonia. 14 to zero. Then I'm wondering why we have to change our constitution when human rights are not applicable. And what about Macedonian community in Bulgaria, which is not allowed by Bulgarian authorities not to be a part of Bulgarian constitution. We are talking about registering non-governmental organization. They're not allowed to register non-governmental organization, NGO. So I don't have an argument to stand in front of my citizens and to convince them, look, you have to accept this. You have to accept this and no one can guarantee you that this is the last. No one can guarantee you that six months from now, someone else, someone that will come from the East again and again, will request something additional. Why? I'm afraid. And why we have such a fear? This is not a fear based on illusion. This is a fear based on the evidence and the former experience during the past more than two and a half decades since our journey started. Why we are afraid? Because, let me flag this, in our negotiating framework with the European Union, for the first, and I pray and hope for the last time, we have bilateral issues, bilateral agreements, a part of the Copenhagen criteria. No one has, no one from the former Warsaw Pact countries, which become a member of the EU, and the other countries had similar situation. Probably there was a sort of similar case between Slovenia and Croatia, but it was solved based on the leveled playing field when Croatia became a part of the EU. Now we are faced with an ultimatum. That's it on the table. You have to accept this or that's it. Your story will end here. So whether ultimatum or dictat, has something in common with the European, truly European values? No. That's why we as a new government would like to be constructive. We would like to talk. We would like to sit on the table and to explain feeling, to convey feeling, frustration of our citizens because they feel being betrayed. Although, and despite all those challenges in the past, humiliations, sacrifices, like no one did before, we have more than three quarters support of citizens of my country to become a part of the European family. More than 75%. Still, this, uh, Eurosceptics are not are not a vast majority, quite contrary. Pro-Europeans are vast majority. I'm talking about more than 75% of our population. And as I said at the very beginning, we are landlocked, small country at the heart of the Balkans. And I will talk about this for someone's disadvantage. We have to be smart and we have to con convert this advantage into the advantage if we want to have a decent future and if we want to improve the standard of living of my citizens. So, being a constructive means that you have to provide always and always solutions. Our last proposal is something what might look very constructive and acceptable for all I'm always trying to talk with some language that can be understood 
northern from Vienna, please don't get me wrong, which means that if Prespa Treaty was masterpiece of European diplomacy, something which is, let's say, brilliant, why we should not replicate this masterpiece for finding a solution, finally, decent, long-lasting, sustainable solution that will provide solution for this artificial dispute. This is not a dispute with the roots. This is a dispute which is artificial dispute. What was the substance of PRESPA? We will, as a country, pass through the parliament constitutional changes. They will become a part of our constitution. But there is always but. Those constitutional changes will become effective when, in that time, Greek parliament would ratify the accession protocol of North Macedonia NATO. Why we should not replicate same, same with our eastern neighbor? Someone from Brussels are asking me, what do you think about this decoupling with Albania? I'm always saying it would not be first, neither probably last time for us. We started our journey together with Romania and Bulgaria. We continued with Croatia. Then we got in the same group with Serbia and Montenegro, Albania, and now probably with Georgia, Moldova, or someone from, from North Africa, who knows who will be again in our group. What is the substance of our dispute? And I'm, I'm ending here. What is the substance of our dispute with our eastern neighbor? The substance is that we were born, according to them, as a nation, 1945, as a product of communist Comintern, and prior to that we were Bulgarians. Whether this has something together with the European values, I'm leaving on you to find an adequate answer. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miskowski. You said you are not a political uh, animal. I don't know whether that's really true. Uh, you, you, you've used the stage perfectly uh, well. Uh, we have a little uh, change of plan. Let me introduce to you uh, the foreign minister uh, of Hungary, Peter Szijjártó. Uh, he's a foreign minister now since 2014. Uh, I guess he's the longest serving uh, foreign minister right now in the Council of, of Europe. Uh, Hungary right now holds the presidency in the EU. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here. Uh, the stage is yours, please. Good morning to all of you. Schönen guten Morgen. Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Das ist meine Ehre, hier zu sein zum ersten Mal im Europa Forum von Salzburg. Uh, unfortunately, as we are here together, it's not an exaggeration to say that we are living in the age of dangers. The European Union, the European continent, uh, has been faced with tremendous challenges. Tremendous uh, challenges from the perspective of our physical security, from the perspective of our identical security, and the, from the perspective of, of our economic uh, security. Why I say that? Because there is a war going on in Ukraine for almost a thousand days now in the heart of Europe. We have been faced with tremendous massive waves of illegal migration for the 10th consecutive year. And on top of that, all our debates in the Council about economics have been heavily over ideologized. What we would propose, what we think would be interest of the European Union. Now, this is not going to be a mainstream position. I'm not quite sure it uh, uh, would be supported uh, by the majority here either. 
But what we do believe is the following, that it is Europe's interest to come to peace in Ukraine. It is Europe's interest to finally stop the migratory waves. And it is Europe's interest to carry out debates based on common sense when it comes to economy. And I have to tell you, uh, dear friends and dear colleagues, we Hungarians are ready to take our fair share. The Hungarian foreign political strategy is being based on three things. Supporting all initiatives which are aiming at reaching peace in Ukraine. Do our best in order to preserve national sovereignty and to promote economic uh, neutrality. What these three means, a couple of thoughts about the three. First on the war. There is an agreement, a common understanding, I guess, in entire Europe that the problem is huge and it can be even much bigger than currently. Why? Because the fights are more and more intense on the battlefield. Winter is approaching with its own challenges and the sanctions simply do not work out. Now, there's a common understanding about this, but then the question is, what is the consequence to be drawn? Because there are two approaches here. First, uh, the, uh, the approach which uh, aims at uh, or initiates more weapons to be delivered, more sanctions uh, to be uh, decided upon, uh, weapons to be uh, applied uh, in the territory of uh, Russia and to get more isolated from the Russian uh, energy uh, sources. This is an approach which has been here for thousand days already and you see the outcome. What is the other approach? The other approach uh, says that instead of the weapons, we should uh, start negotiations, sit around the negotiating table and come finally to a peaceful uh, solution to save lives of the people, not to have more casualties on the battlefield. The, the uh, difference in form between these two approaches is that the first approach has been, uh, in has been in place for a thousand days now and simply don't work out. The second approach didn't get a chance so far. So we think we should give a chance to the second approach, try to concentrate on how to make peace and how not to uh, prolong the war. There's a huge debate in Europe, and unfortunately, I don't see the um, outcome of this debate yet, although, although uh, some events, namely presidential elections, on the other side of the ocean might uh, be the game changer in this respect, for sure. The second, uh, protection of sovereignty. And here I would like to address the issue of migration, which I understand has been an issue here, in Austria as well, especially on during the campaign of the uh, national elections of yours. So here you see that uh, Hungary is currently under financial sanctions. Why? Because protecting the uh, external border of the European Union, making it very clear that all those who want to come in illegally are not allowed to come in. During the last years, we have stopped more than half a million, more than half a million illegal migrants at our uh, border. This is our obligation stemming from the fact that we are part of the Schengen area. And in the meantime, with those measures, we have uh, protected the uh, security of our own country and of our own citizens. And here I think we should come back to the basis of international law. What international law does say? It says that in case someone is forced to leave his or her home, he or she is entitled to stay on the territory of the first safe country temporarily. It doesn't say anything about the second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth safe country. So this means, this means that violating a border between two peaceful countries is a crime and is not a human rights issue. So by definition, whoever would like to violate the border between Serbia and Hungary cannot be considered as a refugee. Why? Because there's no war in Serbia. No one's life is in danger in Serbia. If we cannot come back to the basis of uh, international law, then we will not be able to protect the security of our uh, continent because it will continue as it is now. If a country protects its border, it's going to be under financial sanctions. Third and last, when it comes to economic neutrality, what do I mean under that? We look at it as a huge threat that a kind of economic cold war is to be launched. The world now is supposed to be divided into blocks again. There are huge steps 
made towards this direction. We Hungarians are absolutely not interested in that. We are interested in the next period, the next age, uh, to be uh, characterized by connectivity instead uh, of uh, new Cold War. We Hungarians, we are a mid-sized, small mid-sized country in the heart of Europe, totally landlocked. But our example shows the best what kind of profit and benefit it brings in case East and West can cooperate in a civilized way. Why? Because in Hungary, we are one of the free countries in the world where all three German premium car makers are present. And we are the only country where five of the top 10 Eastern electric battery manufacturers are present as well, including the three biggest Chinese. And the presence of the three biggest Germans and the three biggest Chinese are not independent from each other. If you come to Hungary, you will see a Chinese factory and a German factory next to each other. You will see one of the biggest German automotive companies uh, factory ne next door to one of the biggest Chinese electric battery manufacturer in Hungary. Why? Because they work together. Their strategies are interlinked. And in case of putting uh, artificial barriers on the, on the way of the uh, strategies of those companies which are determining the economic performance of the entire continent, we can cause huge problems. And the European Union will lose even more competitiveness than so far. So when uh, my German colleague, uh, Madam Minister, speaks about decoupling, then I always think how I could receive that phone call the last week from a global CEO of a German company asking me to give cash incentive to its uh, Chinese supplier to come to Hungary. So there's a huge huge difference between reality and, um, and the political uh, arena on many occasions. And if this huge difference stays out there, then uh, unfortunately we don't see the way back to gaining back the uh, competitiveness of the European Union. But we have to work together in order to achieve peace in Ukraine, in order to be able to um, uh, protect Europe from the illegal massive migratory waves, and to gain back um, the uh, economic competitiveness of ours. We understand that there's a lack of common understanding on most of these issues, but I think debates are necessary to be able to come to a solution. Debates where everyone has a seat around the table, hopefully those ones as well, who are now not members of the European Union, but have performed very well to become members, because without the Western Balkans, the European Union is not a completed project. Thank you so much for your very kind invitation, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. So, I would like to, to ask some questions, uh, but the minister is very short on time, uh, and is scheduled for another meetings, but maybe, I can uh, discuss some of the issues that were raised uh, now with uh, Bohud uh, Bahur. Uh, he was not only president of Slovenia from 2012 to 2022, but also prime minister from 2008 to 2012. So a very um, experienced uh, politicians. Uh, and if you may uh, join me, for a little uh, talk. We're a little bit uh, late of time though. I look at uh, uh, Johannes Hahn, but he's still relaxed. Um, and please take a seat. Um, as Foreign Minister uh, Siyartu just has raised uh, Ukraine and, and he more or less said that Europe has the the wrong approach towards uh, this issue. He, he suggested that, that Europe should, should support um, peace negotiations with, with uh, Russia. Do you think that Russia is ready for peace negotiations? Well, I have a problem with, with a, such a statement. Mm -hmm. There is one reason why I have mm -hmm. the problem. The, uh, uh, the government back in Ukraine the president Zelensky uh, are against the negotiation at this time with these terms. So uh, the basic condition for fair negotiation would be a just peace. At the end of the process should be a just, just peace. So I think that we should not go, you know, 
uh, against the political will of the government back in Ukraine and against the political will of elected, uh, uh, you know, legitimately elected President Zelensky. Until Zelensky and the government would like to, you know, fight against uh, the aggression of Russia, I think we should support it. Uh, Minister Seattle just said that it's basically wrong to support uh, Ukraine with weapons. But what, what is your take on that? It, it, well, was, I, it was attacked the, by the, Russia and it's my, just exerting its right of self-defense, isn't it? I think it's appealing to, to, to talk about, the, uh, uh, you know, a peaceful negotiation and peaceful solution of the crisis. Absolutely, I'm in a favor uh, uh, of it. But uh, I think we, we, we should know one thing. If now we will push against their will, uh, Ukrainian people to the negotiation table, I think we would steal them a right to self-defend uh, themselves. I think we are still in a position, there is a consensus among the West that we should support Ukraine because it, it, it's not just the question of Ukraine. Uh, I have been dealing with President uh, Putin for several years. We've met several times. I, I did underestimate his, uh, you know, political vision of uh, some sort of uh, uh, Soviet Union once again. Uh, let, let us not underestimate it now. I think we underestimated uh, the aggression on Crimea. We should not underestimate it, the p possibility that after Ukraine, if Ukraine wouldn't be solved in a proper manner, maybe President Putin would go on. So we should to have our security in front of our eyes. And I think the consensus at the moment on the West to, to work with Ukraine, to fight against Russian aggression is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, Prime Minister Miskowski has, has touched, he mm. called it the never-ending story of the enlargement process uh, in the Western Balkans. I know that, that you are, and Slovenia is, is very supportive of integrating uh, uh, the Western Balkan countries. It, it's been working just like Austria, working for, it for, for quite some time. Uh, in a nutshell, why is it that those six countries aren't uh, members yet? What, what, went, what went wrong? Well, that is at least my vision. Uh, and I know it mm. is not shared by everyone back in Brussels. But I think the time has come because of geopolitical changes in, 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 the, in the Europe and in the world that we should speed up the process of, uh, you know, uh, integration of Western Balkans to the European Union. The time has come. And uh, if we will not recognize this, I think we will make a huge, huge mistake. We have a war in Ukraine. We have a conflict in the Middle East. Uh, uh, Western uh, Balkans is there in the middle. Uh, could be a little small incident that would, you know, fire once again the, the, the whole region. I'm not speaking that the political will of people or the governments, uh, you, you know, are there to, to, to fight against, but, you know, uh, the time has come to, to, to uh, uh, see the uh, project of enlargement a little bit more geopolitical than just technical uh, uh, process. Number one, should be a little bit more political process, and number two, should remain, you know, on the premises of uh, uh, merit-based uh, uh, process. So. Taking both um, uh, approach, I think, would be wise and go on. I, I, I hope so very much that our friends in Skopje will find some sort of compromise with Bulgaria. I know how difficult it is. I, I completely agree with the Prime Minister from an emotional point of view. Uh, from the rational point of view, I, I'm afraid, Mr. Prime Minister, that you will have to invest your, your uh, you know, uh, political determination to, to be once a member of the European Union to some sort of new compromise. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, everybody will wait until uh, this, uh, you know, I will make a, a, a stop here. But uh, I would like to invite you to, to, to do whatever it takes to, to uh, 
open the door for uh, for uh, North Macedonia to go on. I know how difficult it is, but that is the way probably for your country to, to go. Now, this decoupling between North Macedonia and Albania, it, it's not a good sign for your country. And I'm not saying that what Bulgaria is doing, what the, prop, uh, the, 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 the government before you has done was, was, a, was a good job, but I, I think it is so important for North Macedonia, and I'm a friend of your country, that something should be done to, to go on and to, to speed up the process. I know how difficult it is. I know how, I, I do recognize. Thank you. Uh, we're a little bit late on time. I have a, a last question uh, concerning the enlargement process. Do you think that, uh, that the European Union has done its institutional homework already? Is it, is it prepared to take in this is, six or even nine more countries? This is extremely important question. I think we should um, remember the uh, statement by Council President Michel, uh, I think one or two years ago when uh, he said in 2030, European Union should be ready for the enlargement of the Western Balkans. It's a little bit late, isn't it? Well, at least, you know, there is a date. Uh, for the very first time being set by high official, uh, high representative of uh, European Council. I think two statements should be done. One from Brussels, from Council, Commission and maybe from the House, saying we will be ready with our changes, uh, institutional changes and all the stuff until 2030. And all six countries in the region should say in one statement, we will do whatever it takes. I mean, with reforms and all that stuff, peaceful negotiation between us, that we will be ready until 2030. And then I think that would now, uh, uh, in a way, uh, will speed up the, 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 the process of negotiation between Brussels and Western Balkans, which is now at the moment not very, very, very good, in very good shape. Mr. President, thanks a lot. Uh, please give a, uh, an applause to Thank you. Prime Minister Robert Power. Thank you. Thank you.